You are listening to The Catholic Wire. Um, I wanted to use the Baltimore Catechism, and the priest told me, oh, no, 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 we don't do that anymore. And the bishop is telling us things like, oh, now, when you go back, you tell your people that when they come back from communion, they're not supposed to be looking down and, and praying. They're supposed to be looking around. He said, well, you didn't go to St. Michael and Dane, did you? And I said, no. He said, oh, well, you, you don't want to go there. He, he's, he's weird. He is, he's, he's, he's saying the Mass in Latin. He's... I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm coming home. And they were in this big stadium, and they did, they did um, the Stations of the Cross, Mm-hmm. But they had a woman as Christ that we got the word that Father had been killed. What a story to tell. In the last decades, many Catholics have experienced terrible moral persecution. Their faith, their traditions were taken away from the churches. Many have lived for many years ignorant of the deprivation they suffered. Some are still going through that painful and at once beautiful process of rediscovering the Catholic faith. For the encouragement of those still in that journey, faithful Catholics have shared with us their challenges, trials, and blessings. This is the story of their journey, Back to the Faith. Welcome to the Catholic Wire. This is our section of History, stories of conversion, I guess you would say stories. And this is Father Cepeda, your host, and I'm here with uh, Carolyn. We well, can just leave it like that. And yeah, basically, what I what I think would be really interesting is for people to know your story from way back. I mean, you can tell us like something a little bit about you, you know, where you're from, your family, and then just feel free to tell the whole story. We have hours here. I don't care. My dad was in the army, so I was born in Ohio, but we traveled and moved every three years. Um, a very Catholic family. My dad, um, as soon as we went to a new post, he went right away to the chaplain and volunteered to serve or whatever, all the way through his very, very early um, years in the Army. My mother was always a, a volunteer in the, at the church. We always had priests in the family and in the house and for dinner, and very Catholic in the 50s. And we thought it was always going to be this way, that everything would be wonderful and perfect. And then... How many siblings did you have? I'm the oldest of nine. And um, I think the first time I realized that there was something wrong was, must have been in my, well, in my, maybe in my senior year. Um, everything was fine where we were, things hadn't changed. But when I got married in 1969 and we went to the next, our next duty station, because my husband was also in the, ar- in the Army, I, I started and I volunteered right away for, to teach catechism. And I noticed that in this new place in Frankfurt, in Germany, um, the, the other teachers were trying to bring their kids around the altar, and that we're supposed to sit on, sit, sit at the altar. And we're going to have all kinds of. We bring our ball and put them on the altar. Um, what is going on here? I don't, I don't, I don't know what this is. What year was this? Um, that must have been 19. I was more than married in 69, 70, 71. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, we had noticed along in the at mass that all of a sudden we're asked to hold hands at the uh, at the Our Father and we all looked at each other like oh why oh well we were Catholic we we're you know Father's always right with obedience obedience okay Father thinks it's okay it's okay so was didn't it, like it but was the mass in Latin back then or it English? was in Latin and now it's starting to change now things are starting to change the little bit of English is coming into it now we're saying the Our Father in English now. And now, and then after that, we're, we're asked to receive communion in the hand, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is, oh well, obedience. So um, after a while, it was back in, it was in English. The whole thing was in English. Everything was different. We we're facing, Father's facing us. We're, it's, it's a whole new, and we're thinking, what happened to our church? Have you heard the story that Bishop says about uh, Father Kubish from Omaha? Have you heard that story? No, I don't think so. He was... He was a Catholic priest, and, and he was in the Diocese of Omaha, I think. And he would be saying Mass as usual, and then the bishop came and told him that he had to face the people. And he did it once, and he suffered so much during the Mass. 
And so the next Sunday he came over and for the pre- for the sermon, he started preaching to the people facing, giving them their back, his back. So he was like talking to them, giving his back mm-hmm, to the people. Mm-hmm. And he preached the whole sermon like that. And then people were like thrown off. And he told them, do you think this is weird? And he said, well, that's how I feel when I'm saying the mass and I'm facing you. So from now on, I'm not going to do it anymore. What a good story. What a good story. And so many people did realize that this is wrong. This is wrong. And they left right away. But we, where were we going to go? Where were we going to go? So we stayed and we suffered through it. And we would come out of mass and we're arguing, arguing and in bad mood. And Were you still it's, it's by just, that time in America? Or it went, in we're back and forth. We're okay. Germany and then back to the States and then back to Germany again. And because um, I lived 12 years altogether, six years with my family in Germany and six years with my husband Tom in Germany and so we're back and forth and things are changing, things are changing and we're, we're just to the point that I guess this is the Catholic Church now, it's just different, it's you know, the priest has his day off on Wednesday and you don't see the collar anymore, you don't see the cassocks, you don't see the sisters, everything has changed, oh well, and then you go into the priest and you say, Father, I need some spiritual reading nothing about saints, nothing about the mass. It's all about love and to love your neighbor. And I'm thinking, Father, that's so that's so so nothing. That's just water, that's pablum. Well, I don't have anything. <laughs> well, and then it got to the point that, you know, I was teaching, uh, it would have been in the 80s, I was teaching um, a confirmation class to some young high school kids. And um, I wanted to use the Baltimore Catechism. And the priest told me, oh, no, 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 we don't do that anymore. And I thought, how can this be? How can this have changed so much that you know everything is different? I would, te- I would take if I was teaching a younger class, I would say to the whoever's in charge, the sister in charge, I'd like to take the kids to the to the, to the Catholic Church and you know show them the, 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 the everything and show them the monstrance and all those things. Oh no, 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 we don't do that anymore. Mm-mm. So things change, change, change. In fact, in, once we were in Green Bay, I was teaching the, the uh, confirmation class, and because we were such good, good parishioners, mm-hmm. the priest uh, recommended us and a couple of other people to go to this bishop's conference in Green Bay. And it was supposed to be some kind of an honor, I guess. But we got, we got there, and the bishop is telling us things like, oh, now, when you go back, you tell your people that when they come back from communion, they're not supposed to be looking down and, and praying. They're supposed to be looking around because, see, we're all in this together. We're all in this together, and this is this is the church now. We don't do this single, inward, me and, and God. It's all of us now. Mm-hmm. This is just, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. Um, so... Needless to say, when I was teaching, I used the Baltimore Catechism anyway. I'm sorry I was disobedient, but uh, yeah, that's just the way I, you I, had, I had to do it. I couldn't do it any other way. I couldn't do it any other way. Were you doing it without them yes. knowing? Yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> so years passed, and we were, um, Tom retired. We retired up to Wisconsin, the liberal Madison area. And uh, it was time for John Paul to come to the States to go to Denver. And we were wishing, oh, I wish they would show it. At that time, we thought John Paul was wonderful, young, wonderful, vivacious Catholic Pope, and he's going to really do wonderful things for the church. I was going to say that when we were talking with Father Trough, uh, he was very charismatic. Yes. You know, that was dangerous, I guess. Yes, That was was. a problem because he was such a powerful Yes. Uh, figure absolutely. Yeah, absolutely he was an actor too I mean yes exactly yeah. right so by just looking at his pictures you realize this person this guy had the well not not all due respect but you know yes this man had a lot of personality and that's why he draw people one time all the was, young people yeah one time I was talking to someone because they were saying this is when he was still alive I was in high school and he was telling me but you know look at how he's bringing all of humanity together and i was like yeah but they're not going to god exactly he brings them all together but not to god it's just like to stay here stay down on earth it's It's all about us not about anything about god what good is that but sorry you were saying so he was going to come oh yeah so uh, the pope is john paul's going to come to the states going to denver we're in wisconsin but john paul was coming to denver and um and they were going to show it on ewtn we knew that but we didn't get it in our area. We didn't get EWTN. So I thought, well, let me go from parish to parish 
and 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 have the priest sign a, 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 a a sheet that you know, asking what is a petition petition sheet, mm-hmm. and asking EWTN, please show just the just for that week that the the Pope is here, show us you know so we can see. And so I did that and got all the lists, and we were able to have EWTN. We were able to see the Pope. I'll get back to that in just one moment. But I went from parish to parish. We were just new to the area, and I and I asked one of the priests, well, are there any other priests that I've missed? He said, well, you didn't go to St. Michael in Dane, did you? And I said, no. He said, oh, well, you, you don't want to go there. He's, he's, he's weird. He's, 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 he's saying the Mass in Latin. He's, he's got a Catholic school that, you know, he doesn't associate with us. He's, he's completely different. Um, and I, he wears a cassock all the time. And I thought, oh, that's my kind of guy. Yeah. <laughs> so I ran right away to Dane to St. Michael. And, and Father and I talked for a couple of hours. And I, I'm walking through his school. And the kids are walking in line. And they're all so 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 polite and so quiet. And so the sisters don't, I mean, the teacher, there weren't any sisters. But the teachers were all, they didn't have to scream. They didn't, there was no disruptions. It was like it used to be when I was in a Catholic school. It was, everything was, you know, it's just... And there were beautiful statues everywhere, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm coming home. So uh, immediately I took my child, my youngest daughter, out of the Novus Ordo Catholic school where we lived, in the little village where we lived, and brought her right away to the to Dane, to the Catholic school there. Okay. And... Um, so this priest that you found, he yes. was in Wisconsin. He's in Wisconsin, the little the little village outside of our little village, which is just outside of Madison, Wisconsin. Very, very liberal. Very, very liberal. Okay. Was he a part of the diocese? He was with the diocese, and he was saying, it, it, see, he was in a kind of a flux, too, about what to do. He was going along with, he was saying the Novus Ordo, but the more information he got, the more he understood that, Wait a minute. This isn't. None of this is right. The 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 um, um, right of, of of ordination has changed. I mean, ha- these can't be real priests then. Mm-hmm. So he started he started saying the traditional mass. Oh wow! And so um, and he was to the point of, I believe, not saying the Novus Ordo ever again. He was he was. So did they end up showing? They end up showing. John Paul II, probably. They did show John the Paul II, and we thought that was fine, dandy, wonderful, and terrific until they did this, and they were in this big stadium, and they did, they did um, the Stations of the Cross, mm. but they had a woman as Christ. And I thought, oh, no, 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 this can't be, this can't be. And and Mother Angelica of EWTN was, was, was hosting this, mm-hmm. this broadcast, and she was incensed. She immediately took her sisters and put them right back into their 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 traditional habit. She changed completely. She she saw that there's something wrong here. That moment, that was her. Yes, that her... was yes. And from then on, she was her sisters were back in their Franciscan habits. Wow, I didn't mm-hmm. know that. Okay, mm-hmm. my mother used to love yes, Mother Angelica. Yes. We were traditional, like since I was born, pretty much. But I remember her every time I would come back home. She would be what she would mm-hmm. love, Mother Angelica. Yes. And the and the and the rosary and the stations and all the stories and everything was wonderful. But um, Mother Angelica had I think I had her cross too with the Novus Ordo and I, I know it was specifically down there at the at the uh, where the the new church was that she built. It was a wonderful wonderful place and she had planned on having the altar facing the uh, like traditional like uh, a traditional yes yes yes, as they say, yes. but the bishop said no. And mm. so she just kind of faded away after that. She didn't come to the the opening of the church, the dedication. She was supposed to speak. Mm-hmm. She didn't. She, you didn't really see her too much anymore after that. Those must have been the hardest crosses, I think, for the nuns yes. that wanted to be faithful. Because the priest, you know, as a priest, you could go, just go out on your own mm-hmm. and find a place to have mass and do your own thing. But as a nun, you had nowhere exactly. to go. Because as a nun, you, you can't go... Anywhere you, I mean, people will receive a priest. Yes. If you know people want to have mass and everything, yes. but if you go as a nun and you say receive me, it's like you'd have to hide, find someone. And how do you find them? Exactly right. So she must have suffered a great deal, for, for kind of sure. like what Sister Lucia probably went through. Yes, yes, you know, I would, I would say that. that's exactly right. And I had gone to a Sacred Heart. It was Sacred Heart Academy in the fifties and the sixties when I was there at boarding school in Coleman, down mm-hmm. at fifty miles south. And um, and the sisters are wonderful. Until my sophomore year, between my freshman and my sophomore year, one of the sisters went back to Paris. To she was a French teacher, and mm-hmm. and she never came back. 
Mm. And I thought, well, what happened? Is, what happened to her? And they just sisters never said anything about what happened to her. And uh, and we learned later that she fell into the Noah's Ordo. Mm. Then um, several years later, after Tom and I were married, we went came. We're stationed back here at Redstone, and we went down to the, visit Sacred Heart again. And I saw a sister, an older sister, in the in, in her habit, sitting in, in on a bench out in the the gardens, and she was just so forlorn and so you know just like this, just just so so sad. And so you never see a sister like that. You mm-hmm. never see a sister with hopelessness. Yeah. And there she was because she, everything was changing right before her eyes. Everything was changing in, in her whole life, her yeah. whole where she lived, what how she lived, the mass, everything changed completely. I mean, how how what does an older sister do? Yeah, that's so, uh, sorry. No, I don't mean to interrupt no, you, no. but this is my first time, so you know I'm going to be pretty bad here. <laughs> I want to say before uh, anything else goes on. Uh, Caroline has been really nice because uh, I just met her today uh, and I'm asking her to do an interview here. So uh, that's that's very courteous of her. Um, I, I really have a lot of pity for all, all those people because I, I was a religious and I know that as a religious, your vocation means all your life. Yes. It's like you've given everything for yes. that and you have nothing else to go to. Yes. And in those situations, it's very oppressive when you're having a problem like that where it's like what do i do because and more and more more so if you have no support Mm -hmm. so i just can't think and that's something that i think uh the people responsible are are going to have to answer uh, to god for this because how horrible it must have been for them to lose their vocation and here's another thing too when you're religious you love everything about your vocation you love your habit you love the prayers you love the uh, the manner of acting because even the manner of acting is different. The way you address people, you know. I remember when I was a religious, they would insist you have to have your hands under your scapular mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all the time, yes, your hands yes. folded. You have to address each other with the title "Your Charity." Uh, you never look up. You always look to the floor. It's little things that you know for the for atheistic people or masons or whatever that it would seem like oppressive. It's actually not. As a religious, you love those things because that, that becomes who you are and you know that those things bring you to God. And suddenly, this, all these sisters were being told, take it away. You know, yes. you know, d- destroy these things. Nothing of this is left. You're back into the world because that's what they were doing with them is basically, you're not a religious anymore. You have the title, but you're going to have to be back into the world, the world which you despised, which you renounced, which you have lived before. Here we're dumping you again into it. Exactly, so, and and, and in those early years, I mean, they were saying that that in the seminaries they were taking their young seminarians into well, not only just Protestant churches and to to, to deal with Protestant faith and congregations, but to gay bars and to go to bars in particular, any mm-hmm. just just to get out so that you know what the world is really like. Mm-hmm. I'm saying that sarcastically, and that how can that be that you know? It's 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 two completely different worlds. How mm-hmm. can you put a poor seminarian into something like that when he knows those those things are wrong? That's to me that's 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 yeah. just terrible. And I was going to say it's it's hard. I would say that it's hard for the sisters. Where are they going to go? What are they going to do? Also for the priests because I remember when we lived in Wisconsin and 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 Father Kunz would very often we had visiting priests priests that had nowhere else to go. Uh, mm. One of our one of these young uh, not young but older uh, priests would come every every four months or. So and then the bishop would say he's got to go, and so he'd have to move on to somewhere else that he could he could live with someone else. He was a janitor in a high school because he had nowhere else to go, wow. and so very often we had priests just come and visit because Father knew that they were without anything, without any support whatsoever, mm-hmm. and they were just getting odd jobs wherever they could. So it was just as hard on the priests as it was on the sisters. Yeah, mm-hmm. the priest I was telling you about, the one that Bishop told us the story. Yes, he was actually he knew him. And he was telling us that after that happened, the whole story of the pulpit, the priest got summoned by the bishop, obviously. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you have to you have to say the new mass. And, and he said, I, I can't do that. And then the bishop said to him, well, if you say the new mass, we're going to increase your retirement, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and we're going to give you this and you're going to be able to retire sooner, blah, blah, blah. And the priest was, look, Father Kubish was looking at him like, what are you talking about? And he said, y- you know what, Bishop? Hell is forever. And he walked out 
Yeah. And after that, he was pretty much kicked out of the diocese. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, there's all, all kinds just, of stories just, like that. Just, just. Yeah, um, it was it, 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 sort of a different subject, but one, when Father um, when Father Kunz died, um, we were all waiting to, 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 and that they had taken the body, and we were waiting and waiting for, for someone to tell us that it would have to be the diocese to tell us when is the funeral going to be. It was weeks and weeks and weeks. We, I, in fact, I called the the person that represents the Pope in Washington. The nuncio? The yes, the papal nuncio. The papal nuncio? I called him, and I think it was Cachevalan. And I said, "We're waiting for our priest. We want to know when our when the when our poor priest is going to have his funeral." He said, "What are you talking about?" I said, "Well, Father Quince in, in Wisconsin," and and he said, "Oh, we can't take we can't take we can't take, take keep track of every priest that dies." You know, it was very very. And I thought, "Oh, brother, we are orphans. We can't even go now to you know. There's not even anywhere in the papal yeah mire muck to you know to tell us they were completely." Uh, uh, Without, without, yeah, they didn't any, care. any, they could care less. They could care less. So I want to go back to this priest. This is the same priest that you found, right? Yes. Can you can you remember like his name again? His full name or Alfred, Father Alfred Kunz. Alfred Kunz. I'm sure people know him by now. Yes. So how long was he there? How lo how long were you able to go to mass there? Um, we were probably there for maybe five years, and then um, uh, we ended up moving back down to Alabama. And so, and so we left. And so it was a year later, living here in Alabama, that we got the word that father had been killed. Um, okay. He had been. I'm sorry. No. Yeah. Go going to that he, story. He, he was. He was a. It's, it's just what a, what a story to tell. He was a canon lawyer and very um, in tune to what was happening with the bishops and the pedophile priests in the Chicago and the Milwaukee areas. And I, from what, I, what we understand is that he was about to spill some beans. And he was starting to get um, um, death threats, and he started, you know, sleeping in the confessional because so he could at least see and hear. How did you guys find out that he was sleeping in the confessional? He told us. My he told us. Yes, he told us that uh, something's happening. I said, I'm really make sure that we you know, always lock the doors, make sure that we always knew, you know. Um, and sure enough, one morning the kids, the the teachers came into the to the school. And he was laying in the hallway with his throat slit from side to side, and um, the kids saw him. They the were kids the ones didn't. That found the him? teachers, the teachers came in that morning, and before the kids had come, and there, there was father. And so they came in, and they took his books, all of his things in his office, and they took, took father, and eventually we had a funeral. But of course, it was Novus Ordo. This is and this is the same priest that you were not able to get the funeral for. Or that we didn't one? know anything. That we couldn't get the information about the funeral. Yes, is it that's the right. Same one? Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So, a, a very sad story, and and I and I and I, you know, when they talk about the swamp and the government, there's mm -hmm. a swamp in the church too. It's amazing, and we were talking about this before we started this show with uh, uh, the other priest that is in here. Uh, I was mentioning that that manner of killing, you know, is cutting the the throat. It's particular of a certain sect. I won't say who right now, just in case we get canceled. But um, there is a story about uh, Bishop. It was a bishop from Cuba. He's actually a saint. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name. I'll have to add it later to the show. <laughs> <laughs> you forget things when yes. you're speaking next to a microphone. Uh, Claret, Bishop Bishop Claret, San, Saint Anthony Maria Claret. Yes. He was very very much uh, opposed by this sect that we're talking about and one of his friends a priest got killed with that method and what they would do is they would come and tap you on the shoulder you would turn and when you turn your neck someone on the other side would <sighs> slit your throat your throat and they knew that when whenever that was done it was like a public way of saying we killed him oh, as a punishment my gosh, my gosh, my gosh. and they tried to do the same with bishop claret one time he was walking out of a hall and they tapped him on the shoulder and he turned but he was he saw it and he just uh, he uh, bowed his head down so they cut his cheek and they grabbed the person obviously when the when pope Pius IX was trying to create he was trying to create reforms in the vatican in the vatican states mm -hmm. And one of the things that they had asked him to do was to put a prime minister who was a, a civilian rather than a cardinal or a bishop. This is the time where 
masons and all you know all these people were pressing the pope to change things in the vatican and and he agreed to have a civilian be uh, the prime minister of some of the papal states but he put obviously a good catholic and they murdered him the same way it was the the state so in front of everybody it was like in front of a crowd of people so the the amazing thing here is that you would think that the diocese would do something about this priest some criminal investigation or they you know tried the, the, the poli- I don't know about the diocese but I know the police department in in that area in Dane and, and Madison they searched and searched and every clue that they could possibly could find could find nothing and to this mm. day I don't think they've ever found any in any so these people are well, they connected. know what they're doing mm-hmm. they know what they're doing and, and and how to do it and wow but I was gonna say it's important for us to know the names because uh, for two reasons. First of all, if people listen to this and, and you just say the, say the story, but there's no name, it's like uh, they might be making yeah. this up. Because it's it's hard to believe. Yes. When you hear these things, it's hard to believe. Yes. But when you have the name, it's like, okay, this is a fact. And also, this is this is a priest that deserves honor. Yes. You know, the, I mean, this is a martyr, really. Yes. He died for his faith and he died to protect the children and all those things. It's like... Yes. Because here's another thing, and I was just thinking about that when I was coming back. Who else would have killed him? You know, it's like, why would they kill a priest? Exactly. You know, if he was, the only reason why they would kill him is because he was going to denounce the diocese. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of, uh, this is going to be controversial, but that's kind of what gets me about Vigano. You know Vigano? Yes, and, and talk, talk to me about him because... Well, the thing is, you know, it seems very weird that he's saying all these things and, and denouncing all these things and nothing happens to him and he's like way out there and... But he is in hiding, I thought. Is he? Yes, okay. and in fact, he is a valid priest. He was he was ordained three months before the changes in the, in the rite. Okay. So he's a valid priest and since 19 or since 20... 13 or 15 or I don't remember what day it was lately he's, mm-hmm. he says only the traditional mass mm. so I'm wondering he's still denouncing and he's mm-hmm. and he's not he's not a friend of the of the of the church of, of the, the Nova Sordo church of the Nova Sordo church so mm-hmm. I don't know I, but I'm very interested in, in who he is because um, could he be you know the, the the link that we need that when it because surely 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 someday God to will like allow us to have a, a, a real probe again? Could he be mm. a link? Could he be, you know, someone who knows, who knows, who knows? He does know what's going on in the innards of the of, of the Vatican. He knows he was in the financial situation in the Vatican. He was mm. in all kinds of other offices and 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 and, and positions. Mm. But he knows what's going on, and he's denouncing all these things. And he was den- his his latest thing was denouncing Cardinal McCarrick. Mm. Um, I don't know all of the details about those things, but certainly a pedo- pedophile priest. I, I really haven't uh, heard much about him, but my opinion right now is just kind of a res- restricting. Well, and my... I think that's how Father Quinn, uh, Father Father Trough is too. I'm, I was talking to him about it, and I think he's not real sure either. But uh, I th- I think he was a little heartened when I said he is valid and he is saying the traditional mass now mm. that there's hope there for him. And so I always want to believe the best. You know, yes, I always want to believe. Exactly hopefully, right. hopefully, you know, he's he's really there, and hopefully that's going to bring. I mean, a lot of people might be coming to the knowledge of the truth because of that. Exactly. But how many times has we we thought we got them now? We got them. this time. We've got them. Even in politics, yeah. this time they're going to get their comeuppance. Nothing ever happens. Here's what worries me, and and this is a good thing to mention here. Controlled opposition. There's always a movement of controlled opposition. If you are a communist or you know people that are doing those things, when you're bringing a revolution, you have to create a controlled opposition so that if whatever people are coming out of there, you can hold them back and yes. control them. Yes. And that's kind of what has been happening in other movements of traditional, uh, traditional Catholic quote unquote movements, that you know. The modernists are trying to push this revolution. They know that many people are not going to accept it, so they create an opposition that is not fully there, so that all those people can be held back, uh, yes. and they can never do anything. So imagine, for example, how many people would be right now, say, the vacantist, how many churches there would be around, how, how big the churches would be, if there weren't all these little movements of supposed yes. opposition yes. that they can't yes. do anything. Yes, yes. And that's what I'm afraid oh. this might be, but... 
but you know, it doesn't change anything. I mean, we just need to do the best we can and hope. I was, hope I'm, for I'm the hopeful, best, yeah. like you said, yeah. Father. I'm I'm hopeful that maybe this was something that you know he knows the ins and outs of the Vatican. He knows yeah. who's the traditional, more or less, in a, in a Novus Ordo church, and who. And yeah, and the thing is, whenever God wants there to be a, a good pope, a new pope, God's gonna find a way for it. I was reading, and we were doing a Bible study class here on Wednesday nights, and um, I was reading in one of my, the books that I was um, studying for history one years ago, and it said that God uses um, um, ath- ath- not atheists but pagans, um, um, Alexander the oh, Great, yeah, yeah, Alexander yeah. the Great, to move the, the 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 empire this way, and then he used the Egyptians and the, and the this. I'm, this is out of order um, chronologically, mm-hmm. but um, the the empire was expanded this way, and then it was expanded with another king this way, and it was down this way, and then then the Romans took over and took the whole work plus out west and you know Western Europe, and then when it was time for the for Christ to come. The Romans had already laid the roads all throughout this whole entire empire. Everything was ready for the apostles to be able to go from one end to the other and, and preach. So that God uses these so-called, you know, pagan people and, and to, 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 to advance his cause. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm thinking, well, maybe maybe he's using Bishop Vigano. That would be nice. I mean, hopefully, I mean, I, yeah. I'm, I'm always hopeful. I've been disappointed so many times. That's you know, with you think that we've. You know, I don't want to say about the politics, but you think we got them this time, and no, <laughs> yeah. it just goes right over, and, and nothing ever happens to them. But they'll get their, they'll get theirs in the end, I'm sure. But yeah. please, some relief, Father, please. <laughs> yeah, I, that's. I think that's always important. And you know, the thing is, we need to remember that. Our Lord has everything in His hands. Yes, He's so still in you know control. it's like even though things look really bad, and even if things get even worse, yes, He, he has in one in you know in one snap of his, of his fingers, you know, our Lord can just make everything go back to normal. And whenever our Lord wants to, He can give us a Pope. Yes, you know, just like when you look, I, I think of Prophet Elias in the Old Testament and how he went to this cave and and he was telling God, "I'm the only one left." You know, he he was very disappointed. He was very sad. He was discouraged. He he even said, I, "Just let me die." That that's like pretty amazing. Yes. It was Prophet Elias. He yes, was a very strong yes. man. And he was like, "Just let me die." And God told him, "No, you're not the only one. There is other four thousand besides you." So it's like, oh, maybe we we don't know, but there you know, there's that's, a lot of people out there. That's very true. That's very true. It so is. you moved to Alabama. Yes. And then where did you come to mass here? Or uh, when we lived in Wisconsin. And we knew we were coming to Alabama. Um, I had a friend here in, in, in Huntsville, and I called her and I said, Is there, I'd heard in, some information that there was going to be a new high school, a Catholic high school in Huntsville. And I asked her, you know, what do you know about this? And she said, well, I don't know too much about it, but I've got a friend who might, might know a little bit more, and, and, and that was Aurora. Mm. And so Aurora and I, I, we met on the phone, and we talked back and forth. And I eventually um, was kind of excited because we were. It was time for us to homeschool Kate for high school, and I was really. If it was really a Catholic high school, man, I was really excited about this. Yeah, right, yeah. I ended up calling the 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 principal. The school hadn't even opened yet. I called the principal and I said, you know, I'm trying to feel out where do you fit into this, you know, Novus Ordo traditional. It to the, the point was that he didn't want to hear anything about anything pre-Vatican II, the history of our church pre-Vatican II. That was he didn't want to hear anything about it. So I thought, nope, that's at the end of that. We're not gonna. We'll be homeschooling. Mm-hmm. And um, and 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 through Aurora, we found um, the monastery in in Cullman. Um, was that uh, Christ the King? Christ the King, yes. And, and I called Father Leonard, and we hit it off right away. And we came to, to Huntsville, and the next Sunday we were right down there, and we were there ever since until 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 Father died, and and the and the monastery was closed. What was Father like? What was Father Leonard? Mm-hmm. Um, a very happy kind of a, a priest and um, an abbot, and um, um, it was very nice, very very welcoming, and I felt right at home and. Um, how many people used to go to mass there? The church was filled. The church was filled. So there were a lot of people, a lot mm-hmm. of people. And um, then when Father Sebastian closed the church, um, we were traveling from one 
location to another every Sunday. Someone had a trailer and they put all of the things that we had, the books and the... And the so I'm, uh, I'm going to assume that a lot of people probably won't know the whole story. <laughs> so it'd be nice to hear the whole story. I actually don't... I've, I've heard it here and there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it, it comes and goes, but... Uh, It's interesting to be. I didn't know that the the abbey was really close. The, the Christ the King Abbey was a place where uh, there was a priest that he was a vacantist. He was the abbot. Yes. Uh, his name was Father Father Leonard. Father Leonard, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and this was a huge abbey. Yes, they were Benedictines. The Benedictines. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so there was a lot of people going there to for mass. Uh, maybe one we can have later on one show about the whole story. With what I find interesting is that he was a vacantist, but he never said it. No, right? No, no, he didn't want to. I, 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 it was always strange that he would never say that we were... So, uh, basically what happened there was that when Father Leonard died, mm -hmm. the monks that succeeded him, the monk that had charge of the abbey, he basically surrendered everything to the Novus Ordo. Exactly. And this was... Uh, they were, We were talking about it with Father Trough. Uh, the whole monastery went to the Novus Ordo, mm -hmm. the, all the treasures that they had, so to speak. They were treasures, really. And then all the savings that they had as well, right? And after that, the the whole abbey was it dismissed? Like the were the monks dismissed? The monks were gone within um, a, a several weeks. So they it didn't stay Everyone, anymore. I don't know where they all. I mean, I don't know. They how, dispersed. They dispersed for sure. And, okay. And after uh, that, even fathers, the prior even left. I mean, once he was surrendered, he was gone too. And so, could you tell us like? What was the last mass? You know what happened there, or you know. And I don't remember even what time of the year it was. Like I said, my memory is not wonderful anymore. And but I remember on a Sunday after Father had died, um, Father Sebastian a after mass announced that well, from now on we were not welcome to the to the abbey for mass, and that this would be our very last uh, mass at the abbey, and. We, We just looking at each other. We have no clue what's what, what's happening here, and so he was said, "Now it's it, if you'll just leave now, that'll be just fine." And um, and so we left. But one stayed, one of our ladies, and um, Rita stayed, and she prayed. She, she stayed right in her pew, and she prayed and she prayed, and she would not leave. And and the prior called the sheriff, and the sheriff came and he took her out. But. Um, What a what a what a thing! You know, you never expect such a thing in your in your to yeah. happen in your church. But this, but from then on, um, someone knew about the CMRI in the in, in in our group. They immediately called the bishop, and by next Sunday, the following Sunday, we had mass. We had mass in a um, community center or somewhere, but we had mass from then on. The only time we haven't had mass in the last what, almost 10 years is when we had a tremendous tornado and mm -hmm. it took everything. Um, but the CMRI has been there for us. Who was the first priest that came? Father Gregory, uh, Father Benedict came first. Okay. And then Father Gregory flew in every Sunday. Wow. Mm -hmm. I know so, that Father Gregory had a bunch of missions, oh, so he must he have sure been. Oh, he did. How, how, how the priests do this, this, this missions, this is tremendous. It's just fantastic the way the priests uh, give themselves like this. He's acquired a name because I, it's funny. Most of the missions that I've been to... He was there at one point or another. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like Father Gregory was here. Father Gregory was here. He's a good ambassador. He yeah. gets us started, and um, and at that time, uh, I, um, it's a couple of months later. One of our parishioners, who was a real estate person, found this empty, once old restaurant, an empty restaurant on the on the highway here, and it was a good price, and so he bought it, and he said, you know, you're welcome to use it if you if you if you'd like. Hmm. Well, there was a lot of you know consternation about that, and some people didn't want to come, and some people never did come. But Father Gregory realized that uh, it was a good opportunity. Yes, that we needed something that was more permanent. That's what the bishop usually tell, tells us, you know, in the seminary. He says, if there's an opportunity, grab it, mm -hmm. because you know, first of all, you know, usually that's providence. Yes, leaving you, you know, if there's nothing else, then that's what God wants you to yes. do. And also, it's like you can always. Improve. Yes. You know, if you have right. something, grab it. You can yeah. always find something else to yes. improve. I mean, we came into the building, and, and John had the foresight to see that there was something. We could do something with this great giant hall mm -hmm. and with these horrible wooden partition, partitions between the different rooms and the smell of fried fish. 
in the air. <laughs> We're recording and, right now. We're actually sitting here in the hall of, the, of this building. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't smell fish too much anymore. And, uh, you know, every, we, we, we worked and we worked and we, and we worked. We hope to stay here as long as we can. And surely, you know, people want a, a, a real church. Yeah. We all want a real church. That's, that's the thing. Is, uh, we, we were talking about this before and I was saying uh, it would be very useful for people to see the other missions. Because I think it's a very nice place. I, when I saw it, I was like, "Wow, this is very, very nice." You have this huge hall. You have a big church for you know for your needs. You have a big church. You have several rooms all over the place. The priest is able to live in the church, which yes. is it's just awesome. Yes. A lot of times the priests are very far away from the church, and as a priest, you feel that yes. because you know it's very nice to be living and knowing that you have our Lord right there, right there, and you can go say your prayers right before going to bed. You can go and pray to yes. our Lord. And, and also that you're able to guard our Lord. One of my missions is a church that is pretty out there, but you know, it's it, it feels kind of, you know, you're kind of preoccupied that you are not living there, mm -hmm. you know, where the Blessed Sacrament is. If something happens, you know, you're not living there. Yes. So this, this is, I think, is a very nice it, it setup. Really, it, it really is. It, it really, I'm so thankful for it. And I, uh, I, I cannot tell John enough how I thank him for, for having the foresight to do this for us. Now, one day we'll have the cathedral here, you know, the well, that would be, Cathedral. That would be wonderful. The, the that would be Heart. wonderful. And <laughs> I, that would be wonderful. We Surely we want a, a building that looks like a church. And we want, you know, people to drive by and say, oh, there's a Catholic church, instead of driving by and say, oh, that's the old catfish cabin. Mm -hmm, oh, mm -hmm. So someday, whether it's here in this, in this location, which really, I wouldn't mind having it in this location. This is really the central location for all the people that come for, you know, an hour, two hours that's, away to us. That's a big thing too. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sorry if I'm interrupting no, you. No, no, not at all, Father. I'm the host of the show, so that's fine. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Just that's kidding. That's right. You're the boss. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> there in Mexico, where I'm from, Guadalajara, the priests had a house in a very nice area. Very, very nice area. This is like the top area of the city. But it was a very small house very small it was like you could barely feed people it wasn't even a church it was you would have mass and it was like you had people in one room oh. and for, to go to communion mm. you had to go to the vestibule and then go to the other room <laughs> yes. you were hearing mass because you could hear it yes but you couldn't see it yes and the priest they, they were saying this is not good we have to find another place and the other option that they had was a building a horrible place in a in downtown you know the industrial area mm -hmm. we were living the place is next to a nice factory in front of a warehouse. The place itself is a warehouse. And so a lot of people, the, the people we, who had more money, they were saying no, because, you know, we like this place better. Mm -hmm. It's in a very better area. Yes, it's yes. closer to us. Yes. But the other building was closer to everyone. Yes. And it, it, it gave a lot more room. So they ended up buying that. And yes, people, you always have difficulties. Yes. And in any mission, you'll yes. find difficulties and disagreements. There was a lot of people that didn't like it. A lot of people stopped going because it was, yes. well, now it's farther away from yes. us, so we're not going to go. Yes. Guadalajara, there is kind of like Ohio in here, where you have like 10 or 12 different parishes from different groups. But anyways, that ended up working. I mean, that was a place where they had room to expand. They built the monastery for the Carmelites in there. They built the monastery wow. for the sisters in there. Wow. We still had the problem that we would be praying silently, and then you would start hearing, From the industry. Yeah, I'll tell one story that is really funny. One time, we, we started walking to the church, and every morning we would hear in front of us, da 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 so we figured it was a guy working with some power tool. But we heard this for like a year. And it's like, this guy is never stopping. You know, what, what, what kind of job are they doing in front? Finally, we're Carmelites, so we're looking down to the floor all the time. One day, one of the brothers didn't follow the rules, and he looked up. I, maybe it was me. I want to say it was me. <laughs> and it was a, a woodpecker. It was a woodpecker, and he found the, the, the tin roof of one of the warehouses. He loved how it sounds. So every morning, the woodpecker would go up there and go like, da, 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 da. Oh, <laughs> Just that's funny. There. <laughs> he, he, he stayed there for years and years. But that's a big deal to be in a, in a yes. centric place. And we are in an industrial. We're surrounded by fa factories, too, and uh, we're main highway. And there was a house of ill repute across the street when we first came in. And, and, and I know a lot of families decided they weren't going to, they didn't want to come here because they didn't want to drive their family past that house of ill repute. 
And so we we just prayed it away, and in right six in front months, of the church, right? Right there. Yeah. Where that apartment little four place thing is, we just prayed it away. In six months, it was gone. Okay. It closed up and gone. So. Were um, you praying? The rosary, just praying just, with that intention? All, whatever prayers, whatever prayers, for sure, all prayers, masses okay. and everything. So that, and then it was gone. So uh, we did lose a, a, a lot of people, and unfortunately, and um, they, they didn't want to come to a place that didn't look like a church. It was a, an mm -hmm. old restaurant, and it just, well, that's, you know, you, you do with whatever God gives you, that's what you use. And that and, and a lot of people didn't want to put any money into making this place look nice. Well, wait a minute. This is what we have. We're we're meant to make it as beautiful as we can for our Lord. Whatever we're given, we're going to make it. We don't have to spend a lot of money, but we can make it as beautiful as we can. The plumbing and the electrical is just terrible. But yeah. it's, it's, it's what we have, and we're making it as beautiful as we can make it. Yeah. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. What do you think was, like, the hardest... Thing, the hardest uh, struggle in this whole journey towards the true Catholic Church is to see so many people uh, lost. I don't mean lost, to, you know, to heaven. That I, that's not my place to say. But the, 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 they don't have their faith anymore. They don't have their church anymore. Everything has changed. And you know, I blame Vatican II on the whole our whole society because in the '60s, you know. 1969 or 1959 to 60 this was the 50s this was the beautiful 50s where the church was so strong and there were sisters and priests everywhere and even on television and the movies if they were going to talk about any kind of religious uh, function or anything it was always the catholic mass it was always a catholic priest it was always that was that was perfectly every, everyone understood the catholic church at that time it was i guess we were fat dumb and happy and maybe we, you know, let everything happen that, you know, maybe it was our fault that these kinds of things happened. We were too complacent. Hmm. But now when you see that how, as I was going to say, the change in the society in the 60s when Vatican II started, you know, we had learned that the church is unchangeable. It can't change that, you know, and then all of a sudden we're hearing, you know, the priests are apologizing for things that the church supposedly did and that, you know, oh, well, you know, we're going to change this, and the mass is going to change that. Those unchangeable things are now being able to change. Well, I think that it must have affected society too, because now morals are not even the same. So now the, all these hippies, all of the free sex, free, you know, this all happened at that time. And, and not to mention that the war, Vietnam War, was going on at the same time too, but it, there, there was such a tremendous change in the whole society in the, in the 60s, just when the Vatican II was going on. I think that is that is very, very interesting. And because uh, if you notice, that's when everything just started going down. Everything in society. Absolutely, it's everything. Like, as soon as you lost the Pope. Absolutely. And it, it gives you an idea for me. For I have a lot of devotion to the papacy. Uh, and the moment where we lost the Pope, he was the one, the papacy yes. was the one that was holding on yes. the whole world. Yes. All the morals of the world, and, and you see, I was I was raised in a public school all my life. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm born and I'm raised with all the Masonic principles. You know, the French Revolution is great mm -hmm. and all that stuff. And so when I was hearing and talking with Catholics, and I would hear, "This is an error. That's an error." I was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa hold on, it's not a big deal." And and it struck me finally after a while how important it is that the Pope was saying, this is an error, that's an error, this is wrong, that is yes. wrong, because he was the, the bulwark mm -hmm. of morality, of faith, of doctrine. And as soon as you take the Pope away from society, everything just started going yes. boom, boom, yep, yep. boom, down, boom, down, 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 down. Yep. There's no one to give you, you a, more, a moral. Exactly, there was no compass, there was no... No you compass. just did your own thing. You That's just so it's like it's like you being out on the ocean without an anchor. You're just you're just floating along with the you know, what's happening. Whatever happens is, you know, whatever. You mm -hmm. don't have any hope of you know, there's and I guess that is the whole new society, the whole new culture now is we don't need God. We we just have ourselves and don't worry about whether heaven or hell because we we just live now and we'll just, you know, do what we can right now. We're going to have all the fun that we want right now. Don't mm -hmm. worry about that uh, other stuff. And so that's 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 a shame. That's a terrible shame that since Vatican II, the whole of the fabric of society has broken down. No, uh, I should have warned you about these questions beforehand, probably. But uh, the, what do you think has been the most the most encouraging thing? You know, what what is the thing that you're most thankful for? 
Well, I, it was like the very first time that, and I met Father Kunz, and I realized the church is still there. The church is still intact. The church is still the same. And to come to Mass the first time to an, a Latin Mass again, I mean, I ran home and dug out my missile, and I was ready for <laughs> Sunday Mass, and it was just like, it was like coming home. It was like a sigh of relief. It was, so I'm, I'm grateful that I was able to find, my family was able to find that the true church is still there. Some people are still wandering and still looking for it. They mm-hmm. don't know enough yet. that they, They're not seeing enough of the traditional people to know that it is, it is out there. But I also am thinking that um, young people today are, are beginning to realize that this isn't all the, hepped up like it they learned in school that this is going to be a wonderful society that we're going to care for each other and you know we can take care of ourselves and um this is not there's something they're they're missing something they're 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 beginning to look and i think that's why well even for this um the the motu proprio traditional church here in Huntsville in the novus ordo um there are people that are looking for us now I'm hoping that if someday if 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 they're closed down because the Nova Soul is going to get to them eventually, they're eventually going to shut them down. I hope those people come to us and realize that you know we're we're here. Yeah, that was my third question, and that'll be the last. I promise. <laughs> uh, uh, one of the things that concerns me and that worries me sometimes is that I see you who went through all the struggles. You know the people that lived through the changes. Mm-hmm. You were in the battle, so you are very passionate about the mm-hmm, faith. You sure. know, it's like you you suffered when it was taken away from you. You suffered all these struggles and storms. And so for you, it's like, we're going to do everything we can to keep it. And the new generations don't have that. The new generations grew, and they were never... They never suffered the violence of that. Well, they never knew that there was a difference. They never knew that there was anything before what mm-hmm. they have right now. So what would you tell young Catholics, traditional Catholics, young people who didn't live through those changes, what would you tell them to encourage them to keep their faith? What, what advice would you give them? I would say learn about your faith, learn the history, learn the, the tremendous um, gift of, of, of the Catholic Church to, to mankind. You know, this is, this is what our Lord suffered and died for, to give us this faith. And we have it, we're lucky enough to have it, but so many people don't. But learn about it so that you can talk to other people about it. Um, mm. I, I, I loved the, the history of our church and, and the wonderful heroes. And we well, never hear those things in the high school and you never learn those things in a public school. And you're enthall, enthralled and, 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 and you just you get a wonderful new aspect on, on your faith by learning about it. And you know, the more you learn, the more you know, the more, the more you know, the more you love. Mm. So and that's kind of a roundabout way but maybe that's not even very important but to no, me it is, it, it to is, me yeah. it means it, to me if you learn about your faith you're going to know more about it then you're going to love it even more and it's like you know when you if you don't know god you're not going to love him but if you know him the more you know him the more you love him okay. so the same thing with your faith and um it's that's a gift really it's a gift and not many people have it and i think a lot of people are looking for it they don't know that they're looking for it but i think that um, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I want to say I really, really appreciate this. First of all, because this is our first show ever, <laughs> and so you had to suffer me <laughs> learning how to do this. And uh, it's a fast day, so we're both fasting. And then I just met you today, and I just, you know, we were talking on the table, and it's like, okay, we're going to do an interview today. And <laughs> Father Trough answered for you actually. He, he kind of pushed you into it. So I'm. I'm very, very thankful. I think this was a very great show. I think this is going to be very helpful for people. And I know, I know it's hard to put oneself out there. You know, I, I know that it's hard because it's like uh, the virtue of modesty usually mm-hmm. drives us to not want to do that. It's a sacrifice, and I think it's a sacrifice that is worth doing because I, I think a lot of people can be helped by it. You know, I, I, even for myself, I said I'm a priest, and it's very encouraging to see what other people had to go through. It's very encouraging also to, to kind of try harder, you know, to know how much people have suffered to get to the true faith. So I really appreciate it, and I, I really thank you. Uh, you'll be in our prayers. I want to say something else just to finish. Uh, I'm offering one Mass monthly for all our cooperators and all the people that help us, so you'll be included there. Uh, so we will wrap it up with this in the, the Catholic Wire. This is our, our section of 
Stories of conversion. I will have to do that again because it was horrible. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Father. God bless you. Thank you, Father. Bye. Thank you for listening to The Catholic Wire. If you have found this show helpful, please say a prayer for all our collaborators. Don't forget to subscribe to our channels and share with your friends. For questions and comments, you may contact us at thecatholicwire.org.